there, you know, when I, when I start making, writing the book and making the film, people, there were people who asked me, why do it? why because you could never I was worried that I could never do it justice and and I knew I couldn't I knew there was just too much too many lives too many stories and I could never do it justice but when I was when I decided to do it I thought if I could just reach the next generations if I could just tell the generation what it was like because I don't think people understood that even like you saw the film, even the fact that we wore black shirts and black pants. I think you can say this, but I just don't know if people understood what that was like to just not have colors, you know, to wear black shirts and pants. And when we were making the film, Elsa, we were filming it for about four months. And so the actors and, act and, and extras, and we worked with about 20,000 extras, they all wore black shirts and black pants. And you could just feel the heaviness of that weighing on them and at the end of the scene we actually shot the exodus scene the scene of the of everybody leaving Phnom Penh as the last scene because it was huge I mean we had 5,000 people and and it was just a big scene so we shot that last and you could just feel the the, the chimeras and the extras the people just being able to put colorful clothes back on again and how wonderful and lifted that was and so I thought like for just a younger generation, even just seeing how everybody, simple things you, you would think that, you know, just the wearing of black, the cutting of the hairs and, and how that really tried to, you know, how your individuality and your soul and your spirit was taken. So I really worked hard for you, Elsa. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Oh, man. Yeah. Did you, you don't speak any Khmer, right? No. no. Oh. Not yet. We're working on it. That's awesome. Is your mom Khmer, Elsa? No. She's she's half Swedish, half Mexican. Oh, really? Because Elsa kind of looks Khmer. Yeah. <laughs> I think she could pass. I think she could pass. I know. Elsa, you look like you look like you could be related to me. So that's kind of. No. Thank you so much for watching the film. Yeah. yeah. What made you watch it? Um, they told me. Um, hey, sorry, we can't hear you, Elsa. If you could say uh, that one more time. Um, they told me about this movie. And they said that it's still yeah, cutting a little it? bit. There. You on? No, no, no. We, I can't hear Elsa either. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Thank you. I can hear you, Tony, really well. But really? No, no. Yes. That's really strange. You got to speak up then. Yeah. Is that is that a new so, thing? That's really strange. So so she was saying that that um, she's going to watch the interview and and we encouraged her to watch the movie first, so she could have a better understanding of of the situation. Wow. And so I wanted to share her reaction with you because I think it's 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 very special to me to have my kids realize, you know, what it was. God, so. it's very special to me, but you're gonna make me cry before I start. So we gotta get. <laughs> okay. 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 No, no, it's good, Elsa. It's good. Thank you so much. Oh well, man. Thank she's you. So sweet. Yeah, she's, she's, so she's sweet. amazing. She's and amazing. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad she is uh, gonna join you for the presentations. And yeah. if she has questions, I encourage her to ask it. I love hearing young women speak. Um, I don't know if you were, yeah, I think you might have stepped away when Jordana and I were talking about um, another film that I, I was one of a writer, I, w I was a writer on, it's called Girl Rising. I've, and, saw, I've seen that. I've seen that. Such a great experience because, you know, educating girls is how we change the world. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go and get some water. and Screenplay writer Luong. Luong is a survivor of the Cambodian genocide where countless atrocities were committed under the authoritarian rule of the democratic Kampuche of Pol Pot throughout the late 1970s. This horrific event has scarred the history and lives of Cambodia, but its memory lives on to remind us of the perseverance of unity and strength in the face of evil. Please enjoy Luang's presentation and reserve your questions for the end. Thank you.
Welcome to Luong's Ooms. Um, Luong is a, has written many books. Um, the most famous one of them is First They Killed My Father, which was converted into a movie that we can all watch in Netflix. It tells the story of her childhood um, from coming from a happy family, a happy and privileged family, and going to, be, to being transformed into a child soldier and being forced to work in work camps, um, watching her parents die and her siblings also, and 20 other members of her family. She also has two other books. One is called Lucky Child, which is a sequence and tells the story of how, um, what it was growing up in Vermont as a Cambodian refugee, and how it was to reconnect with her sister that was left behind in rural Cambodia. And the third one is Lulu in the Sky, and tells Lu Wong's daily struggle to keep darkness and depression at Bay while she attends college, and finds love in her life. So this is a trailer for um, First They Killed My Father, available on Netflix. Hi, Luong. Hi, I think we're on, right? Hi, so sorry, everybody. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Jordana. It is my pleasure and my honor to be here. And thank you, everybody, um, who, you know, people who are streaming online. This is a very new experience from all of us and um, giving talks on, on Zoom. And so I'm really, really glad you're all turning in. Um, well, I, I wanted to thank you for being here today. I want to thank Beth Quitman, your assistant. She's wonderful. Um, I would also like to thank Nora Lance, um, Pavi Thao, Carrie Moore, Leslie Num, um, Leslie um, Nan Ma, Belly Shinoka, who are a great API group we have here in Bellevue College, and they're really supportive in every single action that we have here, API related. Um, but first, long first to start, when I was doing a research for this um, interview, uh, I, was, I was really shocked about how ignorant I was about everything that happened in Cambodia and, and Cambodia's history in general. So I would like if you could look, talk a little bit about Cambodia and all the events that took place there. What do you sure. Think? Yes. And I, I know also that we are here to speak about resilience. And so we'll get to that as well. Um, and, you know, when people hear my story and from what the audience saw on, on the video, on the trailer, that um, I went through the Khmer Rouge genocide. And after people hear of my story, they often use the word resilience to comment of, of what I went through. Um, and the, the American Psychological Association defines resilience as the ability to recover from adversities. Um, and so that is something we will talk 
a little bit more about how I've been able to overcome my adversities and my difficulties. But first, my story and where I came from. In order to understand where I am now, I, I want to share a little bit about where I came from. And that is that I um, had a very happy childhood growing up. I was born into Cambodia in 1970, which is a very, very long time ago. I know for many of you students, um, not so long for me, but in 1970, um, I came into the world that year when the US Vietnam War had just crossed over to Cambodia. But because I was privileged enough to have parents who took good care of me and sheltered me, I didn't know anything about the war. And so as a result of that, I was able to grow up in this beautiful Cambodia that is at um, 70,000 70, square miles um, in size. It's approximately the size of the state of Washington. We, uh, current, today, current Cambodia has uh, 16 million people living there. Back then, it was 7 million people when I came into it, of which 95% are Buddhists, 90% um, are Khmers, and then um, most people are just living off the land. My Cambodia, the one I was born into, was not known yet as the killing fields in, in the world. So my Cambodia was beautiful. It was so green, but to this day, I've yet to find the green crayons, the crayon in that box of 164, the color in the scenery. My Cambodia was also rich in culture, had, um, has 2,000 year old histories of arts and music and dances and foods and um, architects and, and architectures and, and, uh, and a people who built the largest religious complex in the world. And so for the first five years of my life, I, I lived it very ha happily with my three brothers and three sisters and two parents going to school three days a week, six days, uh, uh, six days a week, three times a day studying Cambodian, Chinese and French and um, having, you know, my fondest memory of growing up in Cambodia was of going to the movie theater with my family of nine, where we would all sit in the dark in the movie theater and the screens would came, come down and then there would be stories of gods and goddesses and monkey kings fighting evils and horrible things. And when I got bored and I got scared, um, I would tap my father's hands and he would just gently turn his palms upwards. And then I would put my food in hands and, and food and drinks in his hand and then just squiggle around on his lap. Because in Cambodia, we didn't have cup holders then. But when you have a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, you didn't need them. So my father's lap was my chairs, his hands, my cup holders. I really thought my life was charmed and that charmed life would come to an end on April 17th, 1975, the day the communist Khmer Rouge came into my country. And on that day, Cambodia became a prison and all the people were turned into prisoners. On that day, the communist Khmer Rouge, who came in and took power to create a new country, a country where they said there would be no class, there would be no caste, where we would all be equal, where we would all be the same, and we would all be able to live our life um, supporting the revolution that we didn't know anything about, a war that we didn't vote in, a government that we knew little of, and so we didn't really have a say. We didn't have a voice. Um, when the Khmer Rouge came in my city, Phnom Penh, which is the capital of Cambodia, it was populated by 2 million people. In a span of 72 hours, we were evacuated. Now imagine that. Where would we go if that happened in America? What would you pack? Where would you... Um, travel to and especially if, if it happened on a day like this and we're here and you're there and your family members and brothers and sisters in a different place how would you find each other again and that was the fate of so many cambodians that to this day we are still looking for people we lost on that day so for the next three years eight months and 21 days my cambodia would become so strange stranger than fiction because i was living in a place you know in I lived in a place where I had rights. I could wear my hair any way I wanted. I could put makeup on. We could go to concert. We could go to pagodas. We could visit our families to living in rural villages that were more akin to labor camps. 
where every day consisted of only Mondays and every Monday was a work day and it didn't matter if you were six or 60. You work, you dug trenches, you grew food, you built dams to support a war you did not vote in, you did not want, you didn't know anything about. And anybody and everybody who did not believe this, who wanted to stand up and protest, who wanted to speak out, were viewed by the Khmer Rouge as enemies of the states, as traitors to the revolution, as traitor to the people, and their solution to what they do with traitors was to crush and purge them. And so the soldiers were sent out into the countryside and they gathered the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the students, the teachers, the dancers, and they had these people executed en masse. And still they look in a regime where it was ruled by, where we were ruled by fear, where we were not allowed to have a voice or a right or be seen or be heard, Everywhere the soldiers looked, they saw more people that they were afraid could speak up, could protest, could stand out. So they sent out more soldiers. And this time they collected the daughters and the sons and the brothers and the fathers and the wives and the mothers of the people they killed. For as long as I live, I will never forget the day the soldiers came for my father. I was seven years old. And on that day, the soldiers came and they told my family and I that they needed my father to go remove an ox cart stuck in the mud. My father went into the hut and talked to my mother and right away she started crying in a way I'd never heard my mother cry before. And when he came back out, he started picking my brothers and sister in his arms and one by one he held them. And when it was my turn, I somehow hit had the instinct of heart to hold my father, to put my little face on against his neck, to remember how it felt when his arms squeezed around me. Because in my heart, I knew I would never see my father again. To this day, many years after the soldiers took him away, I do not know what happened to my father, but this I know. Cambodia, a beautiful country approximately the size of the state of Washington, is today littered with over 20,000 mass graves. And in all these graves, over a million skulls have been accounted for. And they are somebody's fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters. I do not know what happened to my father. But on that day, fear and hate and rage took root in my heart and grew. And three months after my father was taken from me, my mother gathered us around, my siblings and I, and said we were no longer safe to stay with her. She said we had to leave. We had to go north, walk south, go east, find an orphanage camp. Find a place that would take us in and tell them she was dead already. And when I didn't want to go, she turned me by my shoulders, pushed me out the door and said, get out. I don't want you. I was not yet eight. And I thought my mother abandoned me. I thought she didn't love me. I thought she made me leave her because she wasn't strong, because my father worked to keep us together and my mother was pushing us out when he was gone. I thought she was weak. It would take me many more years to realize my mother wasn't weak, that she was the strongest person in my life. But I didn't know that at the time, so off I went anger and hate taking root deeper and deeper. And when I ended at the child soldiers training camp, the instructor saw this in me and didn't take me aside and said, hate will only breed more hate. Hurt will only want to do more hurt. They took me aside and gave me guns half my body's height, a third my body's weight, and taught me to hurt and kill. And I did that because I was vulnerable and because I was scared. My war would end on January 7th, 1979, when I was nine years old. And I am so grateful that it was, that it ended 
before I was put into the front lines to fight a war and to kill other people. And yet it would end also too late. For in that span of three years, eight months, and 20 days under the Khmer Rouge reign, 1.7 to 2 million Cambodians would die to starvation, disease, hard labor, and execution. Among the victims were both my parents, two sisters, and 20 other relatives. And so this was my story. This was what happened to me. And after the war, my oldest brother, Meng, and his wife, and I, looking for a better life, a safer world, a place where we could be educated to live a different life, would make our way to the refugee camps in Thailand, and then six months later would come to America as refugee. So I am very grateful, very grateful for the generosities of the American people, of the country that took us in, a country that I love, a country that I still think is great, a country that opened its arms to people vulnerable like me. I am so grateful that I came into this America. And it is this America that taught me to also be resilient, to be a productive citizen, to learn how to make friends, and to learn about peace, and to work for peace. And this, for me, is why it is for me, it was why I wrote my book and made my movies. I am so grateful to be here, and I am so grateful to be with you guys all right now. I have to say, I have been to Seattle a few times, and um, I don't think I haven't been to Bellevue, but I don't, if it's anything like Seattle, I know that it rained a lot there. But it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It reminded me a lot of Cambodia by just how green and beautiful it was. I landed in America in a state called Vermont, which for those of you who haven't been to Vermont, it is still known as statistically the whitest state in America. For more diversity, I eventually moved to Maine the second white estate in America. When I arrived in Vermont, it was June, and we were told it was their summer. Summer in my country is usually around 100 degrees and 100% humidity. Summer in Vermont was freezing, and I didn't know anything about America. I didn't speak English. And just because I left the war, the war didn't leave me. Just because I traveled and left the genocide and the soldiers, the soldiers and the genocide refused to leave me and followed me to America. And it haunted me when I went to school in America trying to study geometry, trying to memorize grammar rules, trying to study math. The soldiers would hover over my, over my shoulders they would come back in the roar of a low flying plane. They would come back in the hums of a mother's song. They would come back in the laughter of a father playing with his son or daughter in a park. The soldiers came and it would enter into my sleep and turn my slumber into nightmares. It was around this time that I suffered severe depression, anxiety, insecurities, and it was Seeing my distressed friends actually gave me a copy of a book that would change my life. And it is called, it is by Victor Franco, a Holocaust survivors. And the book is called Man's Search for Meaning. And in his book, I learned that I wasn't alone in the things that I suffered, that millions of people in our world, 160 million people in our world have gone through some kind of wars in their country not counting the million more of people who, got, who are going through wars in their relationships, in their cities, in their homes. And so we are a population of survivors. And in Viktor Frankl's book, I also learn about logotherapy, using writing as a tool to 
heal my inner wounds, to, to heal my hurt. And so I started writing my, in my journal. I wrote the words I couldn't speak because I didn't speak English. I wrote the words I was afraid to speak because I was afraid that once I spoke them, I would not stop crying. I wrote the words that I was afraid if I said them would, brought the, would bring the war back to me. I wrote them all into the pages, my feelings, my rage, my heart, and unbeknownst to me, at that time, through my writing, I had begun the work of building my resilience, the work of building a skill set that would allow me to not only heal my wounds, but to thrive in life. For this is what resilience means to me. Miriam Dictionary defined resilience as having the ability to recover rapidly from adversities, illnesses, family separations, everyday challenges, or traumatic events that happens to us. We people who have gone through traumatic situations know also that resilience isn't an innate trait. It isn't something that we were born with. It is a skill set. It is something that we can learn and develop and build and expand and grow. And having these skill sets will allow us to recover from our adversities that much quicker so that we do not just only survive our traumas, but we go on to thrive in life. And when in my writing, I come upon my first, and, and I, through the years, have come to believe that there are four core strengths to what it means to be resilient. And the first core strength of this for me is to be the author of your own story. Be the author of your own story, of your own life. In one session when I was writing in my journals, I had written about when I was nine years old and when I was with my sister walking in the woods collecting firewoods and, and came upon a soldier who then took me into the woods and attempted to rape me. I was nine. I was scared. He was an adult. He had a gun. He wore red briefs. I was so afraid, but somehow I was able to find it in myself to kick him and scream and then to get up and run away. And I, and I escaped. For all these years later, when I left the war and came to America and grew up and went to high school and went to college, I thought to myself often of how lucky I was. And it was fine being lucky, but lucky is not power. And it wasn't until I started writing in my book and in my journals that I saw that it wasn't just luck. That in the midst of that and fear, I was somehow able to bald my hands in the fist I was somehow able to raise my knees into a weapon. I was able to fight the soldier off. And I didn't just ran away from a rape. I fought my way out of a rape. Just saying this, just owning this changed me. Changed how I would see myself, how I would breathe air, how I would walk into a room. Changed me how I would see my own power. Be the author of your life. This is a core part of resilience. You have the power to change your narratives. And so to you audience members, if you have gone through traumas and pain and hurt and betrayals, and in the Buddhist faith, suffering is a part of life. This is one of the four noble truths. Suffering is part of life. And if you have gone through suffering, rewrite your narrative. Rewrite your story to show your strength, your power, your courage, your resiliency. You are all these because you are here. If you weren't, you wouldn't be here. So you are already that. So claim that power. Rewriting my power and my narrative also led me to my second core strengths and beliefs. And it's that being resilient, I had to learn to embrace 
my identity and values. Before this, going through high school, going through college, I doubted my value. I didn't appreciate who I was and who I am. Vermont, again, was the whitest state in America. And because of this, I went through much racism and ignorance of people who didn't know me and yet felt they could judge me. People who never met me and yet feel they could tell me what to do, how I should live my life. People who spoke to me didn't ask when I started learning to speak English, which I didn't learn until I was 10, and instead commented how my family and I spoke broken English. I didn't think I spoke broken English because if you could hear the translations from Khmer in Chinese in my head, you would know that my English makes perfect sense. And I didn't feel broken, even if my words were not always perfect. People who, when all the Vietnam War movies came out, had the gall to come to me. Young boys who would stand up near my high school and say to me when I passed by, five dollar, five dollar for a good time, boom boom or yum yum. Repeating the phrase, the characters, the prostitute characters in the movies would say to the US soldiers and they would think that this was something they could say to me. And they thought this was funny. Well, to those boys now and any boys now then and any boys now who think this is funny, it is not. So stop it. Being resilient also meant that I had to embrace my strengths and my identity. And because I grew up in that environment, I felt a bit of shame, a lot of shame and embarrassment at being Asian, at the fact that my family spoke and speak so many different languages so that when my friends came to visit, they didn't always understand us. But you know what? Our culture, our language, our multiculturalism is vibrant, makes us interesting, makes us never bored of each other. And so when we can't find a word in one language, we throw out another and it is fine with us. I am so grateful that I went through college feeling that when I went to college, feeling that I was alone, that nobody could understand, that I was different and that being different was not good. Being different made me, made me not have the friends I wanted. That when I went to college, I found my crew. I found my people. I joined the International Students Club. I joined the Martin Luther King Society. I joined the Hunger Garden. I found my people who were multicultural, who came from different backgrounds, who knew that being different was beautiful, who could speak different languages, who danced a different music, who ate different food. And when we came together, we were all these things and more. They inspired me and showed me that being different Believing being, being of multicultural backgrounds was a good thing. And so I learned to appreciate and fought and to this day refuse to let anybody else judge me and will stand up for the people who dare judge other people. Because we, in this big world, is that more interesting and rich because we are different because we are of different cultures and languages. And so I began to see that I wasn't just alone. And this is part of my being resilient and being resilient. This is a strength, not being alone, accepting on my identity, valuing the part that with my identity and my values, it's not just because I'm Cambodian and Chinese and American, but it is also because I'm accepting my grandmother, my Chinese grandmother's 5,000 year history. My father, Cambodian father, 2,000 year history. My friends, many hundreds of years of experiences. 
being able to accept our identity and our value means that we accept our ancestors and their strengths and their courage. And when tough things happen to us, as they will do, as they, they will, when things happen, I can look back at the strengths of my ancestors and think to myself, whatever happens, my family, they've gone through it. They've survived it. And so will I. And this is the strength in all of us. For me to write is to go inward, to know who you are, to know what you're about, to know your values and your virtues. But once you've done this, you have a job and a responsibility to go outward. And that is the third core strength of our resilience, is to live a life that isn't just about us, is to make connections and connect to others, is to go inward, support a cause, help others, motivate yourself and others, always have a goal, work towards something, whether it is your personal growth, whether it is to beautify already beautiful Washington State whether it is to change and create a world that is safer and better for all of us. We live in a world populated by 8 billion people and we have the power to create change to make this world a little safer and better for all of us. We have that power. Our resiliency isn't just for us. It is to help make sure our community, our world is resilient. As a human race, we are resilient. Look, all, look at all the things we've survived. Look at what is going on with us right now, our country, our world, with the pandemic lockdown, with this health crisis that is hurting us, us in India, us in Afghanistan, us in, us in Cambodia and Vietnam and America and Brazil, all of us. And yet, as a world, we are a resilient people. As a human race, we are a resilient people. And so resilience isn't just something we build and develop for us. It is something we build and develop and pass forward to help our world and community be resilient. And lastly, the last core strength. No matter how resilient you are, how strong you are, how well you planned your life, things happen. And sometimes terrible things happen that you cannot handle by yourself. You cannot control by yourself. Sometimes things happen that are just so great that you need to ask help. This is a part of your resilience as well. Know when to ask help. Know that it is okay to ask help. Know that it is more than okay to ask for help. That you, when you ask for help, you actually are helping somebody to help you. And that is more of us building connections together. When that happens to me, when I go through a time when I just don't know if I can handle it myself and I think to myself, I don't have a right to ask help, I think of this quote that is one of my favorite. It is attributed to the Buddha of all wonderful people. And the quote says this, you yourself, as much as anybody else in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. So give it to yourself. When you are in harm and, in, and are hurt, ask for help. And that will allow us to all rise together and be strong together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luong. That, that was really beautiful. And um, there's something that always intrigued me about yourself, that you went through all this horror in your life, um, and then you relived it, writing it, relived it again, doing a screenplay, and then relived it once yeah. more, doing your movie. Um, so what, one of the things that 
that most intrigues me is that you've always, you seem really peaceful, like a peaceful person. Um, you seem like a, a kind person, a generous person from all of the, the things that I've observed from you. So how do we not let um, that bitterness of the world get into us? And, and how do we keep kind throughout adversity? How do we keep generous? And how do we keep human even when we're going and, sh and struggling with so much, like in this, in this times? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I, it's, it's really a dual journey. Two things happening in my head at once when, I, when I'm in a place where I'm being tested. And one is that I am very conscious that I am here because so many people have sacrificed and stepped up to help me be here, starting with my parents and what they did so that I could survive. And then starting with my parent, my brothers for bringing, brother for bringing me to America and my sister and brothers in Cambodia for letting me go. And the refugee workers at the camp for helping me to come to America and the teachers and um, the parishioners at the Holy Family Church for bringing me to Vermont. All these people, so many people have come to help me. And I do not want to dishonor their sacrifice and their assistance by not living a life that is honorable. I do not want to dishonor my parents by not being honorable. I want my parents to be proud of me. I, I lost them when I was seven, eight years old. But to this day, I think of their spirits and I feel connected to them. In much of what I do, I want them to be proud wherever they are. I do not want them to look down from wherever they are, heaven or not, wherever they may be, and be ashamed of me. And so first and foremost, I want to honor my parents and my family and, my, and, and the people who've helped me. Secondly, we have power. Sometimes it is just the smallest act of kindness that will change and ripple outward to create a world that is different. Maybe it's a smile. Maybe it's just extending a helping hand, albeit from afar nowadays, <laughs> and practicing social distancing, but extending somebody a kind word that will change their day. We have the power to make a difference, so why not do it? It actually doesn't cost that much to do these things. And when we are able and when we're in the positions to do more, then do more. In the world, in the U.S. alone, there are over a million point five, one point five million charitable organization registered of groups and nonprofit organizations trying to do good work in the world. That's not counting the millions more organizations out in our world. There are so many people doing good work. Why not join them? Knowing that what you do matter. So if you have if you have power and you can choose to change and create a better world, or you can choose to hurt and harm our world, make the right decision because that decision will make all the difference. Thank you, Luong. Um, there's another thing that, that when you talk about um, being resilient and how you build your resilience, one of them, the second point, is to embrace your identity and values. Um, during the Khmer Rouge regime, they wanted everyone to be the same. They, everybody had the same haircut, wore, wore the same clothes, and that's different from being equal. They wanted everything, everyone to have the same thoughts, and there was no more religion, no more private pro property. People couldn't go to school. There was a cultural, cultural devastation and there was one phrase that shocked me that they said that you didn't need um, paper and pen anymore, that rice was your paper and pen. So everyone was, yeah. they, they stopped all schools and everybody just went to the countryside and they wanted to level everyone and put everybody to have the same thoughts. So how do, how do you, how did you build your own identity and how did you reconnect with that after um, spending almost four years with people telling you that you couldn't be yourself, you couldn't have your own thoughts? Yeah. So during the Khmer Rouge, we, it was not safe to have our own thoughts. 
to have a different thought was to make yourself a target and then the soldiers come after you for that. Um, and, and to survive, I had to learn to be dumb, deaf, mute, blind, and invisible, just so I could have the privilege of taking that next breath. I was also raised in a culture where girls were raised to be rarely seen and seldom heard. And so that was already taught to me. And as a result of that, I was a fairly silent child. I didn't speak until I was spoken to. And even then, I had to wait my turn to speak. So you can imagine then coming to America and not speaking the language and not knowing how to speak. And so it was a couple more years before I actually learned enough English to dare to open my mouth. Um, and then when I did and I traveled and I went out, people were judging my identity and my culture as something that was to be made fun of and that was less than. I, it was amazing that people didn't, people didn't know anything about where I come from. And so for me, it was another couple years of feeling embarrassed and ashamed of being Cambodian Chinese and as one man said to me, are you an Oriental? It's like, no, 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 I'm not a vase or a rug. Asian is fine. Cambodian Chinese is even better. And so it really took me going to university, traveling, meeting people who are so proud of their own identities, people who are proud of who they are, and then being inspired from that to learning about myself, to going inward and then becoming proud of myself and proud of my own identity and proud to be a Cambodian and proud to be different and that being a Cambodian um, is more than my history of the Khmer Rouge, which for some people is all Cambodia is, um, especially if they don't know about my history. Cambodia is a 2000 year old culture. The Khmer Rouge is only a four year blip in that span of time. And so to be a Cambodian, I had to learn about my past, my ancestors past. I had to learn its history. I had to learn the land and the language and the food and the music. I had to learn the whole of Cambodia so that I could be proud of the whole of Cambodia and not just be ashamed and afraid of the small blip of four years. And that for me is the wonderful thing about education is that you can learn these things and learning these things will help you build your resilience and will help you embrace your identity and your values so that you could walk taller and straighter and take up more space when you go in the world. Thank you, Luong. Um, now I'm gonna allow participants to unmute themselves. So if you have any questions for Luong, please go ahead. Um, you can unmute your, yourself and then just ask if there's a conflict and what will, for this part, like I just want to, to respect, um, we don't wanna talk about politics here. This is a space where we're talking about resilience and overcoming um, difficulties. And this is not the subject of this conversation. So I respect, I've asked that you kindly respect that um, and keep the questions to Luong directed to Cambodia, her life, and the topic here. Thank you. So, you can go. Sorry, sorry, this is Tony. Did I, sorry for cutting yeah. you off. Go ahead, am Tony. I, am I good to go? Okay. Hi, Luong, thank you for Hi. being here. Um, I really appreciate you. Uh, the words you, you spoke were, were amazing and uh, really, really touched me. Um, I've been, I've been admirer of you for, for several years now. Um, I, I too am a, a Cambodian. A survivor. I was orphaned during the war and um, brought to the United States with 20 other orphans um, and then was adopted by, um, I, I was adopted by an Italian American family. Um, and so I have some of the, I don't have the same experiences as you, but I believe I do have a lot of the scars and trauma. And so I was able to go back to Cambodia um, this last year with my wife on a bike tour. And, you know, just getting to know the culture, getting to know the people that, that I've, I've lost. Um, and my, my question for you is how can I, um, 
after not visit after visiting the Keelan Field Memorial and the S21 prison, uh, I find that that I have this rage and this hate inside me, and and I I I don't know how to to not. And and my question for you is, how do you get past that, and how can how can it not not eat you alive? Because I find that it's a struggle for me to keep it in check. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I mean, for me, the first time I went to Cambodia was in 1995. And since then, I've made over 40 trips back to Cambodia. The first few trips to Cambodia were gut-wrenching, were really difficult and hard. And so I empathize with you going to Cambodia for the first time because the experience was for me was very overwhelming as well to walk the land to visit the killing fields to go to the places where my parents were killed and to relive the memories of what it was like growing up and it all came back to me at once and i was 25 years old and so the only way i could survive that first trip um was to wear dark glasses everywhere i went I wore my sunglasses. I went. I wore it to the restaurant. I wore it pretty much inside a house because when I was, I, I also left my brothers and sister um, behind in Cambodia, and I was reunited with them first time after 15 years, and I hadn't seen them for 15 years, so I carried a lot of guilt of not seeing them and missing them, and um, and then there were a lot of tears. So I I felt I needed to protect myself. And I thought I was hiding my rage so well to, for me. And before I left, you know, my sister was talking to me and she was really worried about how angry, how angry and how full of hurt my, and hate my heart still had. And she was so worried for me. And I started to realize that I couldn't do that to her, that I couldn't return to Cambodia and see my sister and show her only hate and hurt and leave with hurt and rage because she worried so much about me and I didn't want her to have that vision of me. I wanted to build a new relationship with my sister, with Cambodia, with the land, with the culture. I wanted to build something that was more beautiful than the war. And that was for me through writing, through going back as an activist, through working at the Veterans International, where we build prosthetic limbs for victims of landmines, orthotic devices and wheelchairs to help victims of war and, and, and victims of landmines. That, for me, being more involved in Cambodia and learning to, about Cambodia that was much bigger than the war. And that meant for me rewriting my narrative, which I know, I. We've spoken to you, Tony, before. We've spoken before, and I feel this of you. Your narrative is also one of love and the larges of your heart. And I see that in your beautiful daughter, and I hear that in your voice, and, on, and, and I see it in your face. And so the anger and rage can exist, can still, still be there, but you can also write a narrative of Cambodia that is about love, because you are part of that Cambodia. And so is your daughter, and so is your wife, and so it is so important that you be the author of your life. Take back the voice and the life from the soldiers that, who try to take it from you and who try to silence you. Make your voice louder than the soldiers. Make your story bigger and stronger than the soldiers. And for me, when I was able to do that, I was able to walk in Cambodia and still have the war and the anger and the hurt there. But my voice and my compassion and my family and their stories are much louder and stronger than the soldiers in the Khmer Rouge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? Go ahead, Favi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, now we can, yes. Okay, great. Um, my question is, um, I'm from Laos and I also kind of experienced um, trauma 
during that time because we escaped the war um, and I had to live in a refugee in, in Thailand. And so my parents um, endure, just endured so much trauma that, and they're very quiet about what happened. And so I was just wondering, how do we open up and talk to our elderly parents or grandparents so they could like share their stories? Because because currently it's just so painful for them. They won't reveal like what, what they experienced. Yes. Thank you so much, Pavi, for that question. And, and, and I get it. You know, my, my family, there are, there are members of my family um, who can still not talk about it. The experience is so painful that when they start, they would cry and then, and then they would have nightmares and they would not be able to sleep and they would dream about it and, um, and they can't talk about it. And, and my brother Koi, who still lives in Cambodia, is probably one of the toughest men I know. And so strong, so strong. The one time I asked him about my little sister who was four years old when the, um, the soldiers came for her. The only emotion I've ever seen him share when he started talking about her was that his bottom lip started to quiver and started to shake. And then the next thing I knew, he started chain smoking. And that was the end of that. And I couldn't ask him after that. But you know what I did when he wouldn't talk to me, when my brothers and sister and my grandparents just didn't want to talk to me? I actually went to them with, you know, as an educational, I, I asked them the questions as an educational project because Asian parents, I know this is a stereotype and this may not be true for all Asian families and parents, but I know in my Asian families and, and Asian families that if I go to them with anything that had to do with school or college courses or papers I have to write, they will make themselves walk through fire for me. So I went to them and I started asking them questions, um, starting small at first and about their life, about education, about what they wish for me, and just being thankful that they are here and being grateful that they are strong and letting them know before I even ask them questions that I think they are very strong, that I am so grateful they brought me to America, that I think their words in whichever language is perfect, and that they can tell their story to me However broken or not broken, or stall or slow or cut, however they want to tell, even if they wanted to do it in all the different languages at once, that is fine. And so for me, that has been really, really wonderful. And I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, as, as a writer, and now that we've made the film, that my books and film have been used by many young people to watch or read with their family members and then they use that to ask questions because it's hard to answer questions when you feel put on the spot but it's really much better I think when people come to you with questions that they've already researched that they already know a little bit about but that you just want to know their heart story you want to know their spirit stories and not just what happened to them during the war thank you Thank you, Poppy. Thank you, Luong. Um, Megan Watson, you can go, please. Um, I just wanted to ask, because your background is um, as a Korean Chinese, and I don't know too much about the country, but I wanted to know how you, how that was, was that there's something different or how you, your family was treated um, because you identified as kind of both, you weren't um, native, was, did they, kind of target you more because of that? Or was it kind of an aid to you to be able to know these other languages and to get, you know, to be in another, you know, camp and stuff like that, to know how to communicate in that way before you came home to the US? Yeah. Look, during the war, we definitely felt more targeted because um, my, I, I grew up with three brothers and three sisters and half of us are, um, considered more darker skin, and then the other half of us are considered to have lighter skin. And so um, we always, we saw how we were treated differently during the war because the ones with lighter skins were definitely frowned upon and, and, and 
spat on a lot more. And, and so during the war, there were instances when I knew if I saw soldiers, I would put mud on myself to make myself more dirty and, to, and um, so that people couldn't see the Chinese part of me. Um, so I was definitely targeted during the war and went from being proud of being Cambodian Chinese to wishing I wasn't because I thought being bicultural or uh, biracial was going to get me killed. And then when I came to America, of course, all of a sudden I went from um, being Cambodian Chinese to now being told I was yellow, which I never really knew. Americans, when we Asians come to the countries, we do not know that you guys think of us as yellow. Just, I just want to put that out there because we are who we are and, um, and we don't get it. Um, and so for me, that was being also treated differently because all of a sudden I come to, I come to America and there were no differences. You're just looked at as Asian. That affected how I view myself as well. And um, for me, accepting my identities meant that I actually, that I in, 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 uh, incorporated both of my identities, but also I needed to do the work to learn them, learn of them individually as well. Um, and that way I have 200% of who I am as opposed to just 100% of everything that's mixed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. John Chang, please. Let me unmute you there. Did it work? Oh, no, I'm sorry, there. Nope. How about now? Yeah, now. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, Long. How are you? Hi, Mr. Wong. Uh, my name is John Chan. I'm a Chinese American born in Stockton, California, and uh, my grandfather was a paper son. And um, I'm so impressed with your cinematic work. I'm actually an FAA drone pilot, and I do a lot of video editing. I would really love your view of APIs in uh, Hollywood and cinema. <laughs> Um, Hollywood and cinema, it was a very interesting experience. Um, I have been friends with Angelina Jolie for over 20 years. And so I have been able to attend a couple of world premieres where, you know, where I, I am her part of her entourage, it was part of her posse. So that was fun. And um, it was really, really different, different to be, to actually go through the Hollywood experience myself. Our film was um, nominated for the Golden Globe and Critics' Choice and won the Hollywood Film Award. And so I, I was able to go through all that. I have to say, yeah, the, there have been talks in the community about how, a couple of years ago, how um, the catchphrase, Oscars so white. Um, and I always thought, well, Asians, we're, we're doing more of this now, but we're nearly invisible and in the community and um and so you know growing up there were no asians on tv and you know and even through my high school and college i, I remember it, you know you're you're in film there was a film called um, the young people all referred to me by the characters in full metal jacket and platoon and um or apocalypse now and the elderly people would always refer to me to by the film um the world according according to Susie wong for some reason people thought i looked like Susie wong which i don't um she she just so the agents don't look alike people I mean, so for me it was um a really really interesting experience just going through and with that said there have been times where um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I loved it. I love films. I love the story we were able to tell. I love how people were um, using their creativities. And I love the most, I have to say, the making of it. For me, being able to make it in Cambodia. We shot the film uh, for about four months in Cambodia. And I was there pretty much every day on the set. And we shot it with an all Cambodian cast speaking the Khmer language, and there are only approximately 17, 18 million or so of 8 billion people in the world who speaks Khmer, but we still made a film in it. And working with a talented Cambodian crew of 
artists and designers and musicians and lighting directors and grip and being with Cambodians 20 or so extra thousand extras 20 or so thousand extras who came together who are all either descendants or survivors of the war themselves who came together because they wanted to be a part of this and as a result they put their imprint and their dna onto the onto the screen and so it was our film i love that about making film actually so thank you for your question writing it it's such a solitary experience. It's just you and the pen and your head, but film, you are there having a collective experience. You are there to laugh together, to hurt together, to support each other. I also love that um, I was there, it was such a healing experience because when, um, again, I always think that if I needed to hide my emotions, I wear sunglasses. And um, on the film set, there were days often when I was, when I would be emotional, I would wear sunglasses. And I thought I was hiding my emotions so well from the cast and crew. And yet every time I had this happen, I would feel a gentle hand on my back. I would feel just a wisp of a person right next to me, a small child holding my hand. I would see somebody walking by me with such kind expressions on their faces. And I just know they know I'm going through, I was going through something. And they were there for me. And that was such a gift. And so I love film for that. I love the making of film. Um, and I really, really hope to um, you know, I'm really, really so grateful we were able to do that. That and working with one of my closest friends in the world. So that was fun. All right, we're here. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Oh yeah, you can't see my sign. Okay, it says yeah. on mute. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I've queued up your movie on Netflix and happy API Heritage Month. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jordana, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, um, no. you, can, you can go now, Nora. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to know, you had, so I know you had a brother and a sister that stayed in Cambodia. Um, and I know you had a little sister, which you're, you still do not know where she is, but the two that live in Cambodia, how was their life like? Um, why didn't they go to the United States with your other brother and you? Okay. So the, I have, um, after the Khmer genocide, four other uns and my siblings and myself survived. So there were five of us. Mm -hmm. My oldest brother um, was decided to leave. And so we, there were only two ways out of Cambodia after the war, by boat or by land. Mm -hmm. By land, you had to cross. Cambodia into Thailand, of which we knew the borders in between were littered with these tiny little weapon systems called landmines and guarded by soldiers. So it was a much dangerous, more dangerous route. By boat, you had to get two ounces of gold per person or, or raise two, three ounces of gold per person, which I think amounted to about $45. And my family and I had nothing and my brother was only able to raise enough gold to take three people out. And so my oldest brother chose his wife and then he had to pick one of four siblings and I was the chosen child to come with him to America. When we left, we didn't know when we would see each other again, when we didn't know if we would be able to go back. We had heard that if we got to places where we could get citizenship, we could return to Cambodia in five years and that was the promise we made our siblings. We didn't go back for 15 years. Because after we left and landed in America, and though I didn't know about America, America had a law, um, and, and um, you know, when I became a US citizen at 18, with my passport, I was able to study abroad, I was able to travel to different places, but I couldn't go to Cambodia. Because America um, was in a war in Vietnam, and then Vietnam and 180,000 troops went into Cambodia and then stopped the genocide and, and stayed there for 10 years. And the enemy of our enemy is our friend. So in the US government viewpoint, Cambodia was no longer a friend. 
And so even with my passport, I was not allowed to go back to Cambodia until U.S. normalized relationship with Vietnam in 1991 and then with Cambodia until 1993. And even then it wasn't really safe. Um, so I was legally not allowed to go back to Cambodia. And not only not allowed to go, we couldn't send letters. We couldn't send posts. So we had to go and send letters and posts via Canada to get food and clothes and medicines to our families in, in Cambodia. So that was why we were not able to bring them in. And by the time we got our citizenship and, and uh, were able to, um, to, to file the paperwork to bring them in, um, we came upon another obstacle. That in the U.S. immigration uh, in policy, if you are a child, you are more likely and able to bring in a parent or a parent to a child. But when you are a sibling, when you are siblings, you are at the pretty much bottom of the totem pole. And so you prioritize, you're, 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 you're prioritized at the bottom of the list. And we were just not able to do that. And every time, and you couldn't ask them to not, to stop life and stop living life. And every time a brother or sister got married and had a child, paperwork had to be restarted all over again. And so as a result, they just never got out. Thank you. But they are happy and healthy and grandparents. Um, they are, they are my, both my siblings are grandparents. My sister's married um, and, and uh, they're doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. So Luong, um, you've always talk about strength. And people talk about how strong you are to have survived all of this. But did you know how strong you were? Like, did you feel that inside of you? Or, or was it more like just you, like going through and, and just saying, I have to survive, I have to survive? Yeah. Or is, is it something also that you built? Or do you think that, that it was within you? Yeah. I have always felt physically strong. It's probably because I am number six of seven. So I have many older brothers and sisters before me and therefore I had to learn to, to, to really fight with my brothers and sister. So I've always felt physically strong, even in the war during the, during the Khmer Rouge. I, I have always had, I was always, I, would, I always knew I could run. I always knew I wasn't afraid to fight. I always knew I could um, physically do things, even though I'm, you know, tiny and, you know, on my license, it says I'm barely five, two, <laughs> you know? but for me, resilience, learning and building my resilience was not, not just taking care of my body physically and staying healthy and fostering a, a healthy mindset was more important than, was just as important as having a healthy body. And I had thought that being physically strong meant that I couldn't be emotionally strong. And that tears were somehow signs of my weaknesses. And so I have, I have had to learn that but being strong also means that you have emotions, that you can cry and will cry, that your heart will break, but that the heart, as medical um, doctors have, I believe, said, the heart is the strongest muscle in the human body. For as many times as it will break, it has the ability to heal and to recover. And so we needn't fear our hearts breaking because we know it is the strongest muscle in the human body. And that is something that I've had to learn to not just be physically strong, but to know that I also have emotional strength. Thank you. Um, there's also that really intrigues me in yourself because I saw an interview you talking about how guilty you felt about leaving your family behind and, and being able to have a different life than your siblings had and from things that had happened to you in the past. And that's a, a feeling that we all share. Like we all feel guilty about something. And sometimes we let it um, dominate us and take, and take its emotional strength on us. So how did you overcome your guilt? Yeah. 
I, I don't know if I completely overcome them. They, I have, again, rewritten my life so that my work, my activism, my, the way I live in the world, be kind and be compassionate is stronger than the guilt that continued to, to haunt me. Um, I do feel, you know, I, I, I do and have felt so much guilt for leaving my sister behind and for not seeing her for 15 years. And during those times, there were years where I didn't write back to her when she wrote me. And that still breaks my heart. That still is so hard for me to realize that when my sister wrote me from Cambodia, there were years I couldn't write her back because I wanted to live my American dream. I wanted to get my citizenship. I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to go out on dates. I wanted to go out to dinners. I wanted to go dancing. I wanted to live my American dream and not having her with me was just so difficult. And I felt that not having her with me and thinking about her and feeling guilty about what she didn't have and how, and, and, and that stopped me from having a good time. And that really slowly started to ease when I started to go back to Cambodia and realize that I can have a great time with my sister. I really love her. She's funny and interesting and crazy. And she still tells me to brush my hair all the time. I was like, it is what it is. <laughs> you know? and, and my sister, when I first went back to Cambodia, asked me, what are, what's so poignant that she's so wise and soulful. And her word, one of her worries was, she literally was wondering who brushed my hair. Because in Cambodia, we girls, cousins and stuff, would go to the rivers together and wash and shower and, and bathe in the, in the river. And then you brush each other's hair. And in, in doing that, you are sharing stories, you're sharing life, you're sharing love. And then for me, there was no one to do that. And she thought that was so sad. And she got so sad when I told her about this thing called hair conditioner, that you spritz on your hair and it's like smooth in seconds. Um, and for her, it was about connections. It was connecting in connections. And she was worried about that. I, since going to Cambodia, I've been able to ease that guilt a bit by the work I do. And also realizing that there are things in life you may never ever get over. And that is okay. One of my, I, I, one of the hard things I think of, of being in the West and living in America sometimes is this emphasis, this focus about having and, make, and having closures on things and words like healing and closures and, you know, sometimes you, you sometimes your heart breaks and it doesn't mean that it will ever, and even if it never heals completely, it doesn't mean that you cannot also live a really vibrant full life. And that even if you don't have closure on any one thing, it doesn't mean that you can't also live a very full, real, fully realized life. And for example, I use of this is that um, I used to be an avid biker, my husband and I. And then I, a couple of years ago, had a bad skiing accident and ending up ended up compressing C2 and C3 in my neck. And as a result of that, I can't really go riding bikes by myself anymore because looking down will stress out my neck. So what do I do? We get a tandem bike. And so now every time my neck hurts, I can sit up. And every time I travel, I have to travel with a neck pillow, with a neck pillow. And so you adapt and you adjust, but you can still do all the things you want to do. You just have to find a different way of doing it. Um, and, and so that is really important to me to let people know, to me anyway, there's no such thing as closure. There is no such thing as healing any one part of yourself completely. But there is and are ways of living alongside your pain and making your story and your narratives of joy and love and laughter just as bright and just as vibrant even with the pain you've gone through. Thank you so much, this is beautiful. Um, does anybody else have any questions? You can just unmute yourself if you want to. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, Megan, do you have do you have another question, Megan, or is that um, still from the one before? That was just from the before. So. I'm sorry. Okay, so I think, let me see if I see anyone. I think this is it, Luong. Um, is there thank anything you. else you want to add? No. I just want to say thank you so much. And I know this is a difficult time for so many people. And my husband and I are owners of three restaurants and two microbreweries that have been shuttered um, as a result of the pandemic. And so I, I just want to put out there that I hope you are all well. Please stay safe. Please take care. You are strong and we will get through this together. And when we do, we will come out stronger for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody that was here um, this afternoon talking to us and taking a little bit of their time to, to participate in this API Heritage Month event. I want to thank Ethan from BCAP for, for being a co-sponsor of this event and Luong and, and Beth for their time and, and being so kind with us and generous all this time. And it's been a special moment that we've all learned a lot. Thank you so much, Luong. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I think John um, Chen still has one other question. Oh. Let me... Okay, John. Yes, uh, Ethan would like to say something now. Ethan? Ethan Cruz. Um, let me find him. I'm sorry. Alphabetical below, or you can click Perfect. on his window. Okay. Perfect. I'm sorry, Perfect. Ethan. Yeah, no worries. No worries. No worries. Um, I did have a question, and this one will um, it's kind of relating to now, the present, and the future. Um, so I wrote it down just so I knew I wouldn't forget it. Um, but so I'm, I'm very touched with how you focus on how you persevere uh, is, is through acts of kindness and reacting with kindness to uh, like difficult situations and trauma. And so right now we are living through a difficult time where people of Asian heritage, uh, heritage are, are scapegoated and targeted as the reason behind this pandemic. Um, obviously not true. So how can we combat this hate? Because, you know, online I see lots of unregulated hate on social media where people bandwagon and they will verbally hurt any anyone who's Asian uh, for something they're not responsible for. And anytime I've tried uh, to make a response to these comments, it's usually responded tenfold, like more anger and more blind hatred. Um, so what, do you, what advice do you have to protect and defend our fellow Americans of Asian descent um, as we move forward in this pandemic? And once, you know, it's, it, it, it goes on and we can finally see each other as well in person and not just over social media. And Ethan, I'll add on to that. That's why I have this backdrop is because this happened in Seattle a week ago and nobody knows who did it yet. Yeah. So it, it's being Asian. I have, since I came to America in 1980, and probably for the first 10 years there were, because I was in Vermont, I, I felt that I stood out. And I have to say the last couple of months, I have, I have feel a, a change. And when, I'm, when I am going for rides and, um, you know, and even just beginning of March, it, and, and even now, when I'm ordering food, I actually have my husband, who is American, do it because his name's American. Because I've heard from friends who are getting delivery and pickups and who are or going to do curbside pickups because they're Asian, they're looked at differently or they don't feel safe and um, they feel like they're, they're being targeted. And, and I, that has been really difficult. That has just, it makes me, again, it makes me mad. It, it makes me want to go out and scream and, and get into fights. All the little girl fight, the, the little fighter in me is, are now coming out stronger, much stronger in this. Our powers is in the fact that we know who we are. Our powers in the fact that we are together is in the fact that you're speaking up and um, you're, you're all speaking up, that we're all together and this is Asian Heritage Month and we are 
putting this show and, and you and we're here and speaking up. And I think it is so important that we speak up, that we, we that we continue to be seen, to be heard. Stop worrying about for, for people who are no for people of Asian descent, do not worry about when you form the most perfect sentence or when your sentence can be the most Per, can be spoken with the most perfect grammar. Speak up, speak up, speak loud, speak proud. Look up because we help build America. And there are different programs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was, you know, there are, are different documentary, different stories, but we are the story. So people don't have to go online to watch that. We could, we are the story. We are part of we're, we're part of the immigrant community in America that has changed the face of America, that has made it so much more vibrant, that has given it so much soul. And so there is nothing in other people's criticism and ignorance that can take this away from us. People may look at my face and judge me because my face is Asian. And they may hear my words and judge me because sometimes I will just still break English just because I want to. But they can never take away my story. They can never take away what I've contributed to America as a taxpaying citizen, as an owner of a restaurant or three restaurants that hired and had 150 employees, as a builder of America. This is who we are, and this is why we are proud. And if you can't see this, then you really need to have your eyes checked. I don't know how to say it any stronger than this because you, it is you. It's not us. It is you. We know who you are. You should learn who we are because we are America. Sorry. I get so passionate about this. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you. Um, let me see. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, it's filled with passion. And, and thank you so much. And then also thank you to John for noticing that I was uh, waving my hand there. I didn't know about the raise hand feature until right now. So thank you so much. Thank we're you. We're all learning to use Zoom. This is, this is new. Yeah, me too. Yes. Struggling. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anyone ha want to add anything? Let me see if I can see any, go in here to see. The okay, so I think this is it. Um, thank you so much, Luang. Thank this you, thank you so much. So, so good and, and um, I just feel so well talking to you. Like you, you, you make us feel comfortable at home and, and you're so approachable and you're so wise and, and all put together. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope our paths cross one day. Me too. I hope we yeah. can see each other in person. Right. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.